Chapter 13, wherein the angel releases Freckles, and the curse of Black Jack falls upon her. On the line, the angel gave one backward glance at Black Jack to see that he had returned to his work. Then she gathered her skirts above her knees and leaped forward on the run. In the first three yards, she passed Freckles' wheel. Instantly, she imagined that that was why he had insisted on her coming by the trail. She seized it and sprang on. The saddle was too high, but she was an expert rider and could catch the pedals as they came up. She stopped at Duncan's cabin long enough to remedy this, telling Mrs. Duncan while working what was happening, and for her to follow the east trail until she found the bird woman, and told her that she had gone after McLean, and for her to leave the swamp as quickly as possible. Even with her fear for freckles to spur her, Sarah Duncan blanched and began shivering at the idea of facing the Limberlost. The angel looked her in the eyes. No matter how afraid you are, you must go, she said. If you don't, the bird woman will go to Freckles' room hunting me, and they will have trouble with her. If she isn't told to leave at once, they may follow me and, finding I'm gone, do some terrible thing to Freckles. I can't go, that's flat, for if they caught me, then there'd be no one to go for help. You don't suppose they intend to take out the trees thereafter and then leave Freckles to run and tell? They mean to murder the boy. That's what they have planned to do. You run, and run for life, for Freckles is life. You can ride back with the bird woman. The angel saw Mrs. Duncan started and then began her race. Those awful miles of corduroy. Would they never end? She did not dare use the wheel too roughly, for if it broke, she never could arrive on time afoot. Where her way was impassable for the wheel, she jumped off, and pushing it beside her or carrying it, she ran as fast as she could. The day was fearfully warm. The sun poured with the fierce baking heat of August. The bushes claimed her hat, and she did not stop for it. Where it was at all possible, the angel mounted and pounded over the corduroy again. She was panting for breath and almost worn out when she reached the level pike. She had no idea how long she had been, and only two miles covered. She leaned over the bars, almost standing on the pedals, racing with all the strength in her body. The blood surged in her ears and her head swam, but she kept a straight course and rode and rode. It seemed to her that she was standing still while the, while the trees and houses were flying past her. Once a farmer's big dog rushed angrily into the road and she swerved until she almost fell. But she regained her balance, and setting her muscles, pedaled as fast as she could. At last she lifted her head. Surely it could not be over a mile more. She had covered two of corduroy and at least three of pike, and it was only six in all. She was reeling in the saddle, but she gripped the bars with new energy and raced desperately. The sun beat down on her bare head and hands. Just when she was choking with dust and almost prostrate with heat and exhaustion, crash! She ran into a broken bottle. Snap! went the tire. The wheel swerved and pitch over. The angel rolled into the thick yellow dust of the road and lay quietly. From afar, Duncan began to notice a strange dust-covered object in the road as he headed toward town with the first load of the day's felling. He chirruped to the bays and hurried them all he could. As he neared the angel, he saw it was a woman in a broken wheel. He was beside her in an instant. He carried her to a shaded fence corner, stretched her on the grass, and wiped the dust from the lovely face, all dirt-streaked, crimson, and wearing a startling whiteness round the mouth and nose. Wheels were common enough. Many of the farmers' daughters owned them and rode them, but he knew these same farmers' daughters. This face was a stranger's. He glanced at the angel's tumbled clothing, the silkiness of her hair with its pale satin ribbon, and noticed that she had lost her hat. His lips tightened in an ominous quiver. He left her and picked up the wheel as he had surmised he knew it. This, then, was Freckles' swamp angel. There was trouble in the Limberlost, and she had broken down racing to McLean. Duncan turned the bays, and bays into a fence corner, tied one of them, unharnessed the other, fastened up the trace chains, and hurried to the nearest farmhouse to send help to the angel. He found a woman who took a bottle of camphor, a jug of water, and some towels, and started on the run. Then Duncan put the bay to speed and raced for camp. The angel left alone lay still for a second, then she shivered and opened her eyes. She saw that she was on the grass and the broken wheel beside her. Instantly, she realized that someone had carried her there and gone for help. She sat up and looked around. She saw the load of logs and the one horse. Someone was riding for help for her. Oh, poor Freckles, she wailed. 
They may be killing him by now. Oh, how much time have I wasted? She hurried to the other bay, and her fingers flew as she set him free. Snatching up a big black snake whip that lay on the ground, she caught the, ha the hames, stretched along the horse's neck, and for the first time, the fine big fellow felt on his back the quality of the lash that Duncan was accustomed to crack over him. He was frightened and ran at top speed. The angel passed a wildly waving, screaming woman on the road, and a little later a man riding as if he too were in great haste. The man called to her, but she only lay lower and slashed away with a whip. Soon the feet of the man's horse sounded further and further away. At the south camp they were loading a second wagon when the angel appeared riding one of Duncan's bays, lathered and dripping, and cried, Everybody, go to Freckles! There are thieves stealing trees, and they have him bound. They're going to kill him. She wheeled the horse and headed for the Limberlost. The alarm sounded over camp. The gang were not unprepared. McLean sprang to Nellie's back and raced after the angel. As they passed Duncan, he wheeled and followed. Soon the pike was an irregular procession of barebacked riders, wildly driving flying horses toward the swamp. The boss rode neck and neck with the angel. He repeatedly commanded her to stop and fall out of line until he remembered that he would need her to lead him to Freckles. Then he gave up and rode beside her, for she was sending the bay at as sharp a pace as the other horses could keep and hold out. He could see that she was not hearing him. He glanced back and saw that Duncan was close. There was something terrifying in the appearance of the big man and the way he sat his beast and rode. It would be a sad day for the man on whom Duncan's wrath broke. There were four others close behind him and the pike filling with the remainder of the gang, so McLean took heart and raced beside the angel. Over and over he asked her where the trouble was, but he could get no reply. She only gripped the hames, leaned along the bay's neck, and slashed away with the black snake. The steaming horse, with crimson nostrils and heaving sides, stretched out and ran for home with all the speed there was in him. When they passed the cabin, the bird woman's carriage was there, and Mrs. Duncan in the door wringing her hands, but the bird woman was nowhere to be seen. The angel sent the bay along the path and turned into the trail to the west, and the men bunched and followed her. When she reached the entrance to Freckles' room, there were four men with her, and two more very close behind. She slid from the horse and, snatching the little revolver from her pocket, darted for the bushes. McLean caught them back and, with drawn weapon, pressed beside her. There, they stopped in astonishment. The bird woman blocked the entrance. Over a small limb lay her revolver, and it was trained at short range on Black, Jack, and Wessner, who stood with their hands above their heads. Freckles, with the blood streaming down his face from an ugly cut in his temple, was gagged and bound to the tree again, and the remainder of the men were gone. Black Jack was raving as a maniac, and when they looked closer, it was only the left arm that he raised. His right, with the hand shattered, hung helpless at his side, and his revolver lay at Freckles' feet. Westner's weapon was still in his belt, and beside him, Freckles' club. Freckles' face was white with colorless lips, but in his eyes was the strength of undying courage. McLean pushed past the bird woman, crying, Hold steady on them for just one minute more. He snatched the revolver from Wessner's belt and stooped for Jack. At that instant, the angel rushed past. She tore the gag from Freckles and, seizing the rope, knotted on his chest, she tugged at it desperately. Under her fingers it gave way and she hurled it to McLean. The men were crowding in and Duncan seized Wessner. As the angel saw Freckles stand out free, she reached her arms to him and pitched forward. A fearful, fearful oath burst from the lips of Black Jack. To have saved his life, Freckles could not have avoided the glance of triumph he gave Jack, as he folded the angel in his arms and stretched her on the mosses. The bird woman cried out sharply for water as she ran to them. Someone sprang for that and another to break open the case for brandy. As McLean arose from binding Westner, there came a cry that Jack was escaping. He was already far in the swamp, running for its densest part and leaping bounds. Every man who could be spared plunged after him. Other members of the gang arriving were sent to follow the tracks of the wagons. The Teamsters had driven from the west entrance, and crossing the swale had taken the same route the bird woman and the angel used before them. There had been ample time for the drivers to reach the road. After that, they could take any one of four directions. Traffic was heavy, and lumber wagons were passing almost constantly, so the men turned back and joined the more exciting hunt for a man. The remainder of the gang joined them, also farmers from the Pike, and travelers attracted by the disturbance. Watchers were set all along the trail at short intervals, and they patrolled the lines and roads through the swamp that night with lighted torches 
and the next day McLean headed as thorough a search as he felt could be made of one side, while Duncan covered the other. But Black Jack could not be found. Spies were set around his home in Wildcat Hollow to ascertain if he reached there, or aid was being sent in any direction to him. But it was soon clear that his relatives were ignorant of his hiding place and were searching for him. Great is the elasticity of youth. A hot bath and a night sound sleep renewed Freckles' strength, and it needed but little more to work the same result with the angel. Freckles was on the trail early, early the next morning. Besides a crowd of people anxious to witness Jack's capture, he found four stalwart guards, one at each turn. In his heart, he was compelled to admit that he was glad to have them here. Close noon, McLean placed his men in charge of Duncan, and taking Freckles, drove to town to see how it fared with the angel. McLean visited a greenhouse and br bought an armload of its finest products, but Freckles would have none of them. He would carry his message in a glowing mass of the Limberlost's first goldenrod. The bird woman received them, and in answer to their eager inquiries, said that the angel was in no way seriously injured, only so bruised and shaken that their doctor had ordered her to lie quietly for the day. Though she was sore and stiff, they were having work to keep her in bed. Her callers sent up their flowers with their grateful regards, and the angel promptly returned word that she wanted to see them. She reached both hands to McLean. What if one old tree is gone? You don't care, sir. You feel the freckles has kept his trust as nobody ever did before, don't you? You won't forget all those long first days of fright that you told us of, the fearful cold of winter, the rain, heat, and lonesomeness, and the brave days, and lately nights, too, and let him feel that his trust is broken. Oh, Mr. McLean, she begged, say something to him. Do something to make him feel that it isn't for nothing he has watched and suffered it out with that old limber lost. Make him see how great and fine it is, and how far, far better he has done than any, any you or any of us expected. What's one old tree anyway, she cried passionately. I was thinking before you came. Those other men were rank, big cowards. They were scared for their lives. If they were the drivers, I wager you, gloves against gloves, they never took those logs to the pike. My coming upset them. Before you feel badly any more, you go look and see if they didn't lose courage the minute they left Westner and Black Jack and dump that timber and go on the run. I don't believe they ever had the grit to drive out with it in daylight. Go see if they didn't figure on leaving the way we did the other morning, and you'll find the logs before you strike the road. They never risked taking them into the open, and when they got away and had time to think, of course they didn't. And then another thing, you haven't lost your wager. It never will be claimed because you made it with a stout, dark, red-faced man who drives a bay and a gray. He was right back of you, Mr. McLean, when I came yesterday. He went deathly white and shook on his feet when he saw those men probably would be caught. Some one of them was something to him, and you can just spot him for one of the men at the bottom of your troubles, urging those younger fellows to steal from you. I suppose he'd promise to divide. You settle with him, and that business will stop. She turned to Freckles. And you be the happiest man alive because you have kept your trust. Go look where I tell you, and you'll find the logs. I can see just about where they are. When they go up that steep little hill into the next woods, after the cornfield, why, they could unloose the chains, and the logs would roll from the wagons themselves. Now you go look. And Mr. McLean, you do feel that Freckles has been brave and faithful? You won't love him any the less, even if you don't find the logs? The angel's nerve gave way, and she began to cry. Freckles could not endure it. He almost ran from the room with the tears in his eyes, but McLean took the angel from the bird woman's arms and kissed her brave little face and stroked her hair and petted her into quietness before he left. As they drove to the swamp, McLean so earnestly seconded all that the angel had said that he soon had the boy feeling much better. Freckles, your angel has a spice of the devil in her, but she's superb. You needn't spend any time questioning or bewailing anything she does. Just worship blindly, my boy. By heaven, she's sense, courage, and beauty for half a dozen girls, said McLean. It's altogether right you are, sir, affirmed Freckles heartily. Presently, he added, there's no question, but the series is over now. Don't think it, answered McLean. The bird woman is working for success, and success along any line is not won by being scared out. She will be back on the usual day, and ten to one, the angel will be with her. They are made of rather stern stuff, and they don't scare worth a cent. Just before I left, I told the bird woman it would be safe, and it will. You may do your usual walking, but those four guards are there to remain. They are under, under your orders, absolutely. They are prohibited from firing on any bird or molesting anything that you want to protect. 
but there they stay. And this time it is useless for you to say one word. I have listened to your pride too long. You are too precious to me. And that voice of yours is too precious to the world to run any more risks. I am sorry to have anything spoiled the series, said Freckles, and I'd love them to be coming. The angel is special, but it can't be. You'll have to tell them so. You see, Jack would have been ready to stake his life. She meant what she said and did to him. When the teams pulled out, Westner seized, seized me, and he and Jack went to quarreling over whether they should finish me then or take me to, to the next tree they were for fouling. Between them, they were pulling me around and hurting me bad. Westner wanted to get at me right then, and Jack said he shouldn't be touching me till the last tree was out and all the rest of them gone. I believe in Jack really hated to see me done for in the beginning, and I think, too, he was afraid if Westner finished me, then he'd lose his nerve and cut and they couldn't be managing the felling without him. Anyway, they were hauling me around like I was already past all feeling, and they tied me up again. To keep me courage up, I twits Westner about having to tie me, and needing another man to help handle me. I told him what I'd do to him if I was free, and he grabs up my own club and lays open my head with it. When the blood came streaming, it set Jack raving, and he cursed and damned Westner for a coward and a softy. Then Westner turned on Jack and gives it to him for letting the angel make a fool of him. Tells him she was just playing with him, and beyond all manner of doubt she'd gone after you, and there was nothing to do on account of his foolishness but finish me. Get out and let the rest of the timber go, for likely you was on the right way then. And it drove Jack plum crazy. I don't think he was for having a doubt of the angel before, but then he just raved. He grabbed out his gun and turned on Wesner. Spang! It went out of his fist and the order comes, hands up! Wesner reached for kingdom come like he was expecting to grab hold and pull himself up. Jack puts up what, we, what he has left. Then he leans over to me and tells me what he'll do to me if he ever gets out of there alive. Then, just like a snake hissing, he spits out what he'll do to her for playing him. He did get away, and with his strength, that wound in his hand won't be bothering him long. He'll do to me just what he said. And when he hears it really was she who went after you, why, he'll keep his oath about her. He's lived in the swamp all his life, sir, and everybody says it's always been the home of cutthroats, outlaws, and runaways. He knows its most secret places as none of the others. He's alive. He's in there now, sir. Some way he'll keep alive. If you'd seen his face all scarlet with passion, twisted with pain, and black with hate, and heard him swearing that oath, you'd know it was a sure thing. I ain't done with him yet, and I've brought this awful thing on her. And I haven't begun with him yet, said McLean, setting his teeth. I've been away too slow and too easy, believing there'd be no greater harm than the loss of a tree. I've sent for a couple of first-class detectives. We'll put them on his track and route them out and rid the country of them. I don't propose for him to stop either our work or our pleasure. As for his being in the swamp now, I don't believe it. He'd find a way out last night in spite of us. Don't you worry. I'm at the helm now, and I'll see to that gentleman in my own way. I wish to my soul you had seen and heard him, said Freckles, unconvinced. They entered the swamp, taking the route followed by the bird woman and the angel. They really did find the logs, almost where the angel had predicted they would be. McLean went to the south camp and had an interview with Crowen that completely convinced him that the angel was correct there also. But he had no proof, so all he could do was to discharge the man, although his guilt was so apparent that he offered to withdraw the wager. Then McLean sent for a pack of bloodhounds and put them on the trail of Black Jack. They clung to it and on and on into the depths of the swamp, leading their followers through what had been considered impassable and impenetrable ways. And finally, round near to the west entrance and into the swale. Here the dogs bellowed, raved, and fell over each other from their excitement. They raced back and forth from swamp to swale, but follow the scent farther they would not, even though cruelly driven. At last their owner attributed their actions to snakes, and as they were very valuable dogs, abandoned the effort to urge them on so that all they really established was the fact that Black Jack had eluded their vigilance and crossed the trail sometime in the night. He had escaped to the swale. From there, he probably crossed the corduroy and, reaching the lower end of the swamp, had found friends. At any rate, it was a great relief to feel that he was not in the swamp, and it raised the spirits of every man on the line, though many of them expressed regrets that he who was undoubtedly most to blame should escape, and Westner, who in the beginning was only his tool, be left to punishment. 
but for Freckles, with Jack's fearful oath ringing in his ears, there was neither rest nor peace. He was almost ill when the day for the next study of the series arrived, and he saw the bird woman and the angel coming down the corduroy. The guards of the east line he left at their customary places, but those of the west he brought over and placed, one near Little Chicken's tree and the other at the carriage. He was firm about the angels remaining in the carriage, which he did not offer to have unhitched. He went with the bird woman for the picture, which was the easiest matter it had been at any time yet, for the simple reason that the placing of the guards and the unusual movement about the swamp had made Mr. and Mrs. Chicken timid, and they had not carried Little Chicken the customary amount of food. Freckles and in the anxiety of the past few days had neglected him, and he had been so hungry much of the time that when the bird woman held up a sweetbread, although he had started for the recesses of the log at her coming, he changed his mind. With slightly open beak, he waited anxiously for the treat, and gave a study of great value, showing every point of his head and his wing and tail development as well. When the bird woman proposed to look for other subjects close to the line, Freckles went so far as to tell her that Jack had made fearful threats against the angel. He implored her to take the angel home and keep her under unceasing guard until Jack was located. He wanted to tell her all about it, but he knew how dear the angel was to her, and he dreaded to burden her with his fears when they might prove groundless. He allowed her to go, and then blamed himself fiercely that he had done so.